We're going to move on to the most recent iteration of the guidelines. Uh, here are the key points and learning objectives. We'll be able to describe the optimal medical therapy for aneurysmal disease of the aorta, summarize a few of the other conditions not mentioned by uh, Dr. Byers. Thanks, I'm not as tall as you. Summarize other conditions and diseases uh, associated with aortic aneurysm, and then discuss uh, when to refer a patient with thoracic aortic aneurysm for surgical evaluation. Um, so 2010 was the most recent uh, guideline, and this is all, every society you could find who had any relationship with aneurysms, including surgical, cardiac, uh, and radiology, vascular surgery, um, were all involved in making the, uh, the guidelines. Um, there have been no updates since this time, other than uh, a few regarding bicuspid valve, which we'll get into. So talking about, we just saw a lot of different uh, genes and um, uh, dis certain diseases that were associated, but there are a few others that weren't mentioned, and those were the ones that I wanted to touch on because although we often we're making the diagnosis by CT scan, it is possible in some cases at least to have a heightened awareness. So as an ER physician or a primary care physician or as a cardiologist who is ever evaluating these patients, with certain symptoms, they may come in with chest pain. If they if they have some of these other things, you're going to be more in tune and looking for a thoracic aneurysm. Um, bicuspid valve was mentioned because there is a genetic you know basis to that. Uh, aberrant right subclavian artery is another one, as our uh, coarctation of the aorta and a right-sided aortic arch. I'll show you some pictures of those. Um, bicuspid valve was was talked about, and you can see. Uh, the normal aortic valve with the right and left cusp, and then the bicuspid on the, on the uh, right side shows the fusion, of the most common, the uh, right and left cusps, cusps are fused, and that's associated with aortic aneurysms. And what's interesting is that uh, it is, as, as was mentioned by Dr. Byers, it is uh, often familial, although some patients, their family member may not have the bicuspid valve, doesn't mean they're free of um, thoracic aortic disease. Um, so that's also, and it, it's not always easy to see on echocardiogram. I know some of us are, really struggle when you see a transthoracic aorta and you see that what the, the, the uh, rafe there between the two cusps, it can look like they're three cusps, but really on a closer look it isn't. Um, and it's actually quite common, about 1% of people have a bicuspid aortic valve, so one in 100. How many people are here? Someone raised their hand. All right. Oh, okay. You want me to speak up? Is that what that meant? Okay, sorry about that. Uh, so, um, yeah, but basically all patients with bicuspid aortic valve, we want to make sure it's, this is in the guidelines um, to have um, imaging of the aortic root and the ascending thoracic aorta evaluated for any evidence of, of uh, dilation. Um, and then also first degree relatives as well. An aberrant right subclavian artery. So this picture shows already aneurysmal disease in the aorta and what's important about these isn't the aberrancy of the right subclavian but that the aorta is not normal and these people are prone to uh, having aneurysm, uh, aneurysms and potentially dissections. You can see the um, where there's a gray section with an X on it, that's where the normal right subclavian should be. Uh, that should be coming off of the anomino artery. And in this, in people with the aberrant right subclavian, it comes off as the fourth branch. And that has to do with the embryology. And it crosses behind the trachea and esophagus. And that can present with symptoms of dysphagia or um, wheezing or other airway disease-like uh, symptoms. And then imaging is done and it's made, uh, a diagnosis would be made by a CT scan. Um, the coarctation, I think most people are, are familiar with. These people are, are prone to uh, aneurysmal disease and they will need to be, even after correction, most are found in, uh, you know, in childhood. Um, but in the adults, they have to be followed for life because of uh, problems related post-repair. Um, right-sided aortic arch, shown on the right there, shows, again, the aorta. Um, and this is also more common uh, than is, you know, it's probably about uh, half a percent of people have a right-sided aortic arch. 
and you can see it courses to the right instead of to the left and it passes again be behind the esophagus and the uh, trachea and can cause symptoms there. Um, uh, other diseases um, associated with thoracic aortic disease are inflammatory in nature. And these include uh, vasculitides like Takayasu's giant cell, um, Bechet disease, ankylosing spondylitis, and infective aneurysms. Um, so Takayasu, Takayasu arteritis is a vasculitis or inflammation of the vessels, the larger blood vessels you can see uh, on the right. Um, there is inflammation and it can lead to aneurysmal disease as well as stenosis. So it would present with symptoms. Initially, usually these people have uh, fever, malaise, and uh, either weight loss, and then they can present later with symptoms related to whichever artery is involved. And on the left, you can see giant cell arteritis, and that often is also known as uh, excuse me, temporal arteritis. It's affecting the temporal artery. This, this can progress to blindness, uh, so that's important. Both of these are treated with steroids, and the aorta needs to be imaged, as that can be involved in all of these. Um, I'll spare you pictures of Bechet's disease, which is uh, recurrent genital and oral ulcers. Um, um, moving on to the uh, medical uh, medical treatment uh, um, uh, for patients who have known thoracic aortic disease, um, actually medical medical therapy is critically important for these people, and I, we we shouldn't skip skip over that. Um, even though this is a surgical based conference, this is really important. Um, blood pressure control is the first, the most important thing, and the primary therapy is going to be beta blocker. They do all of the things that we need to do to prevent progression of the um, aortic uh, aneurysmal dilatation. They slow the heart rate. They will decrease um, the, the force of the ventricular contraction and decrease blood pressure. All those three things help to slow progression of aneurysmal dilatation, which is typically about a millimeter per year, but it can vary uh, quite a bit from patient to patient. Um, so in terms of uh, class recommendations, which I've listed there, class one means it's definitely beneficial and you should do that. Class two means that the benefit is, is greater than the risk and, you, and it's recommended to do it. Class three is harm is likely, uh, you're, you're more likely to harm the patient. Um, and you'll also see level of recommendation in some of these slides. Uh, a means there's been a, you know, randomized controlled trials. B means there's um, one controlled trial or observational studies. And C, which is a, a lot of the evidence for what we're doing, is just uh, based on expert opinion. Um, this lipidemia, I believe, should be treated in all these patients. Um, it's class 2A with a statin to a goal LDL of less than 70. So the same that we'd use with someone with known coronary disease. You would treat these patients the same with, uh, with a statin. And class 1 recommendation for smoking cessation, it's easy to write down. It's very hard in practice. I don't know how much time we spend talking with patients trying to get them to stop. I'm, now I'm using hypnotists more and more, referring to hypnotists because we've run out of stuff. And sometimes it works. So. Um, let's see, um, ascending aortic aneurysm. So here's a recommendation um, for degenerative disease. Uh, so these are different uh, de degenerative aneurysms as opposed to, and there is overlap, but as opposed to patients with bicuspid valve or Marfans um, or some of the other um, genetic-based diseases. Um, of course, there's going to be overlap between these two, but this is in general. Um, what we should do with these people. When the aneurysm is between three and a half and four and a half centimeters, you want to get an annual CT scan. And once it reaches um, 4.5 uh, centimeters, you want to get it every six months and have your, have your surgeon be aware. They should meet the patient at this time. You don't want to be sending them when it's, you know, six centimeters or when it's too late. Um, so, and I think Dr. Yusuf will probably talk more, or I'm not sure who's going to talk more about indications for repair. I didn't want to get into that. Um, but once, uh, the, other, the other important point is if you see a rapid growth, so normal growth is at about a millimeter per year. If you're seeing growth at uh, five millimeters per year, that's concerning, and the patient be, should be uh, evaluated by a surgeon. 
um, for people with um, bicuspid or other genetic based, uh, the recommendations are um, slightly different in terms of the indication for operative repair. Uh, once you're getting to four and a half uh, centimeters, if they're symptomatic, you definitely want to repair that or if there's rapid growth. Um, so it's slightly, uh, slightly decreased the size in which we're going to consider repair. And by, by cuspid is tricky. We could talk about that more later and when, when they tend to rupture as opposed to uh, patients with Marfan's. Um, uh, this is the Cleveland Clinic guideline. They kind of have their own set of guidelines. Um, what's what's uh, interesting about this, their, um, their algorithm does talk about re activity restriction. So in addition to blood pressure control, um, smoking cessation, lipid management, uh, there is important uh, the guidelines regarding activity. And it's, this is the difficult uh, part for patients, many who are involved in sports or want to live an active lifestyle. They want to lift weights. Um, unfortunately, we do need to restrict those things even after repair is done. Um, avoiding Valsalva maneuver or bearing down and heavy lifting is, is really important. That can raise your uh, systolic blood pressure even up to 300 millimeters mercury. Um, in terms of activity, though, they don't need to become sedentary. These people can, it is recommended, they continue to participate in cardiovascular exercise or aerobic exercise at even up to a moderate level. Um, the, the key is avoiding lifting and weight. Often they'll ask, I have a number of patients who ask me, well, how much, they want to get back to the gym, how much can I lift? Can, and, and they bargaining with me, can, can I do, can I bench, I want to bench, uh, can I do 100, can I do 200, they want, a, they want a number. But really a lot of it, you know, the, for a 70-year-old, for a um, more frail person is going to be different than a, you know, a 250-pound guy who was an athlete. Uh, so that the numbers are going to be different. A lot of it has to do with how much effort they're putting in. So they shouldn't be having to Valsalva if they're needing to Valsalva or bear down to lift the weight, then that's, that's too much for them and they're putting themselves at risk. Um, let's see. Um, bicuspid valves we talked about. So these are typically how guidelines are, are written where you can see a, a class of recommendation and then a level of evidence. This was the one that was updated in 2015 because there was disagreement between the valve guidelines that came out in 2014 and the and the um, aortic guidelines from 2010. So they made an addendum to, to talk about when it's reasonable to repair, because um, in bicuspid valve, you'll have aortic stenosis or aortic regurgitation often involved. So um, if a patient has, depend on the size of the aneurysm of the ascending aorta, when you're going for a surgery, do you just leave the aorta alone? Do you just fix the valve? These are important questions that the surgeon and cardiologist need to discuss. Um, um, Post-procedural care, it comes down to basically the same things as preoperative care. Patients, they stop smoking when they're in the hospital, they go out, they're with their friends, they're at Starbucks, they have their coffee. Next thing they have a cigarette in their hands. So it's really important, continued smoking cessation. These patients are still at risk. Activity restriction, the weight limits will still apply. They're not cured. Even though their aneurysm may have been repaired, they're not cured of the disease. So they are still at risk and we need to control their blood pressure. Um, talked about you know where, how low. Um, guidelines recommend below 140. Um, that's a class one systolic. Uh, I think there's a class two recommendation to get it even even lower. So as low as the patient can tolerate it. And I, I tend to follow those guidelines, getting it lower and lower um, till the you know as long as the patient's not symptomatic. Um, adding after a second choice would be an ACE inhibitor after the beta blocker. Um, and for surveillance, I think uh, Dr. Brockenbrough touched on this a little bit in terms of how frequently do we need to follow these people with, for screening um, after um, a, a repair. And Dr. Hayes, I think, is going to talk about um, endovascular repair as well. So these people do need lifelong follow-up um, after, after surgical or endovascular repair. Um, frequently with CT scan, if renal, if kidney issues become a problem, then um, they can be followed at times with uh, MRA. Um, and employment and lifestyle, we've touched on. Um, uh, 
these people are going to be basically they can go back to work as long as they're not uh, working in a, a job that requires heavy moving and lifting, which some of the patients we have are. That's that's their lifestyle. They need a note, and if they can get you know their job back with restrictions, some of them are able to be moved to something different. Um, but some are working in a warehouse or and they need to lift boxes and they are no longer able to, to do their job. Um, let's see, I think that was about it. And we can get a group, yeah, thanks.